guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's vlog, we are gonna be finishing up our Texas trip with the live stream that both Jesse and I played in. Yes, we were at the same table. You'll see hands from him and I throughout today's video. But before we get into the hands, I have a very quick announcement. I'm so excited about this. This Thursday, December 8th, from noon all the way till midnight, we will be playing in the most epic vlogger game. The stakes are 25.50. The lineup includes Brad Owen, Andrew Nimi, Rampage, Caitlin Kameski, my favorite Texas poker player, poker traveler, etc. There's gonna be a bunch of us there. I'm so excited to be playing in this. I'm a little nervous, I'm not gonna lie, but that's gonna be happening this Thursday on the WPT YouTube and Twitch channels. I can't wait. But for today, let's jump into the video. officially made it you guys. We're here at Rounders. We got Nikki Lim over here. We got Chad, technician slash fan of the vlog, always in the chat. Slash guy who does 36 hour poker session. We just found out that they drew for seats in this live stream game and I get to be directly on Jesse's lap. Love it. Yes, I love getting to three bet him every other hand. It's gonna be really fun. It's a weird dynamic. We've never played on a live stream together before. We haven't, have we? No. We've either... We play with each other on a live stream. We did the tag team. Yeah. And that's it. Today's live stream game is a 1025 game, no seven deuce or slow rolling required, just some straight up two blind poker. But you guys, we're in Texas and y'all know everything is bigger here, including the straddles. So Jesse and I both buy in for $5,000 and we're ready to roll. Jesse gets involved second hand of the stream, so I'm gonna let him kick things off. We start right off the bat with some straddles, just in case it isn't clear exactly how this game is going to be. It starts off when Jack High opens from early position and I peel pocket threes in the cutoff. The big blind, Yu Chan, comes along as well. The 6-4-3 flop is obviously fantastic, and when it checks to me, I decide to bet small. I'm really looking to induce some sort of light check raise, maybe some kind of float from my opponents, and I think a small bet will achieve that. Both players call, and now I'm begging for a blank on the turn. What the dealer puts out is, and I cannot stress my seriousness about this enough, probably the best turn card I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> Second hand quads? Oh my god. So yeah, pretty nice turn. So now when it checks to me, I have to pick a size. I really like going small with my hand. I think if they have a full house or a flush, they're going to raise anyways. And I think that this gives them the maximum opportunity to bluff if they have a hand with just one spade in it. Yu Chan does tank a little bit before raising to 950. This is going really well. Music to yeah. Jesse, Jesse's ears. Now, do you ever feel like you raise here? I feel like sometimes I would. No, let them keep betting because now they're the aggressor and they're out of position. Oh. Wow. <laughs> the river is the ace of spades, which is a weird card for me. I would have expected a lot of his bluffs to come from stuff with the bear ace of spades, and now he can't have that. So I'm hoping that he already made a flush on the turn with something like queen ten of spades, or he has something like the king queen with the king of spades in it and now made a flush on the river, or just had a boat the whole time. Either way, I can't think of too many hands that aren't feeling great when this river card shows up. So I'm not particularly surprised when he fires out 1700, which is right around half my stack. I take a few seconds before giving him the bad news and piling the rest of my chips in as well. He ends up folding, but we still take down a huge pot to start off the session real strong. Hats off to him by the way, he folded the queen of spades getting a pretty insane price. It's a fold that I don't think a lot of people end up finding in game, so really nice job by him there. The very next hand, I'm riding this high, I look down at king nine of diamonds and raise over a limp and Ashley who told me before we started playing that she was going to quote three bet my face off, three bets me. I'm so happy the poker gods delivered the perfect setup for me to go after my poker coach right away in this first orbit. And although this is a pretty standard three bet in my spot, the most interesting part of this hand in my opinion is the fact that Jack High has started off this stream by limping certain hands. So I'm going to keep my eye on him throughout the rest of this game and try to figure out what he's doing that with. Now my hand's pretty weak, so I fold, but let's just say I'm skeptical. 
In this one, I'm in the hijack with Ace Jack Offsu. I finally get to open a hand. I make it $300 to go because the $100 straddle is on. Just the straddle comes along. That's our good friend Jack High in the straddle. So we go heads up to the three deuce deuce rainbow board. And interestingly enough, he leads into me. This is a non-standard play. Normally you don't get led into on this dry of a board texture, especially if they have something strong because they expect you as the pre-flop raiser to be C betting this. So I'm really curious about this. With ace high though, I'm not going anywhere. I stick in the call. The turn comes down the seven of hearts and this guy does not slow down. Now he leads $600 into 880 something. It's a much bigger percentage of the pot than he bet on the flop. I really think that ace high could be good here some of the time, but the question that I asked myself on this turn is whether I would be willing to call off again on the river. Let's say if he overbets river or he goes large on the river. I landed on no and that is why I filled this turn. Even though I thought maybe I could be ahead sometimes, I didn't want to throw in another 600 have this guy bluff again on the river and then not be willing to call it so saving my 600 bucks unfortunately he did have a bluff in this spot he only had six high he was leading with his gutter so not great but i mean it's like a whatever hand it doesn't matter really either way i don't think it's just one of those things where you can level yourself and talk yourself into doing either one and in this moment i chose to fold and move on just two hands after that i looked down at king 10 of spades and raise it up getting two callers out of the blinds the 665 flop brings me a flush draw, and when it checks to me, I decide to do something a little funky and check back. I think betting's fine here, but it would really suck to get check raised and not get to see all five cards with my hand. The turn four is not what we're looking for, and Jack decides to bet big when it checks to him. I'm not ready to fold yet. We still have a fairly strong draw, and I actually think I'm beating a lot of his bluffs. So I call, and then Rob over calls behind me out of the big blind. At this point, I certainly cannot win with my hand at showdown unapproved, but I can still make a flush, and there are some river cards that I'm pretty happy to bluff on. <laughs> Fortunately, plan A gets there, and we just river the jack of spades. It checks to me, I need to decide what size I want to go with here. My opponents could definitely have some traps, so I have to keep that in mind when I choose my sizing. I end up betting around pot. I'm a little concerned that if I go smaller, hands like a straight or a lower flush won't check raise anyways, so this is how I think I'm going to get the maximum. I also feel like if they had plans to bluff raise, this size makes that so much harder for them. They end up folding a couple of real weak hands, so I guess it didn't really matter what size we bet. And we are now up over $4,000 in the first orbit. And one orbit was way too much time for Cedric, the poker traveler, to not be straddling. So he talks me into putting on the $50 straddle just so that he could put on the $100 straddle. And then Rhonda, gangster to his left, throws in $200. And for Jesse, he's definitely played these stakes before. But for me, I'm like, holy crap, this is becoming a huge game. So now we're playing a much bigger game than we normally are for this hand. Big Daddy Chaz, by the way... This guy's name is Big Daddy Chaz. That's like the best poker nickname I've ever heard. Opens from early position. We look down at pocket nines in the first blind. I consider three betting here, but I'm not particularly thrilled to three bet and call it off or three bet fold when we have the stack size. I also think that flatting is good. I wanna keep the pot smaller when I have to play out of position. Everyone else folds and we see a pretty favorable 10-3 deuce flop. Chaz bets small, and I don't really see any reason to do anything but call here. Turn is the six of hearts. I end up checking. Chad takes a pretty large sizing, and this is actually starting to become concerning. I end up calling, but I think it's a mistake. When I have nines, particularly with the nine of hearts, I block a lot of the straight draws that he could have made on the turn. I also block some of the heart draws. So what I end up leaving him with is a lot of over pairs or hands like ace 10. One of the problems with calling is I think that he only bets stronger hands than my hand. And he will always check back hands like ace king or pocket sevens and try to get to showdown. But the calling station in me is just too strong and I flick the chips in. The river is the very safe looking six of spades. I feel like this river card is a bit of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it certainly doesn't improve any of the hands he could have that I was already beating. On the other hand, I'm not particularly convinced that anybody has enough bluffs here when they bet on a card like this. And unfortunately, anybody does include my man Big Daddy Chaz. So when Chaz does put out what looks like a very healthy river bet, I hem and I haw for a bit, but 
I eventually just decide that this isn't one of the best hands I have on the river, and I'm not sure if he's actually bluffing that much, so I finally just let it go. Chaz ended up having pocket queens, and I gotta say that maybe on my best day I could have found a turn fold, but I'm happy that I didn't compound mistakes by calling the river as well. So far this session, I have been super card dead. And when I do get a halfway decent hand, there's a lot of action in front of me and it becomes a weak hand and I just have to fold. And that's going to happen. But being on a live stream, sometimes the dynamic is that you feel this internal pressure to put on a show, to force the action. And having my literal poker coach sitting right next to me, it was really helpful holding myself accountable, not making any plays that I would have to explain to him later. You know, this is a big game for me. I was happy with the fact that I was staying disciplined. That's my little mid-session update. Just one orbit later, we see the return of the $200 straddle when Jack High raises it up from the cutoff. I look down at Ace-Queen offsuit in the first blind, and now I have a decision to make. Jack High started the hand with right around $5,000, which is just 25 straddles. Ashley and Poker Traveler both have about that behind as well. Now, Rhonda's got a little bit more. Rhonda has me covered. I have around 8,000 or 40 straddles. If they all had 25 straddles, I'd be very happy with just shoving all in here with my hand. I think that one player behind having a little bit more than the others doesn't really make me want to deviate from my action. So I ship it in, all the players behind me fold, and now it's back on Jack High. He tanks for a while. He honestly looks pretty pained about his decision. And at one point, I think he calls out my exact hand. At this point, based on his table talk, it becomes extremely clear that he's got a pocket pair. So now I'm just begging for a fold. And eventually, that's exactly what he does. But then he turns it over and he had pocket tens. Wow, I was not expecting that hand to fold. Not something I'd expect to see too often in Texas, though. The literal next hand, there are now no straddles on, and Big Daddy Chaz raises from early position. I look down at pocket tens on the button and begin to question whether or not it's even safe for one man to card rack this hard. I re-raise to $300, which is quite large, but we are very deep, and I do have the button, and I like raising a little bit bigger on the button. Chaz is not impressed and takes very little time before bumping it up to $800. All of a sudden, my hand feels a lot less like the nuts. Either way, we're certainly not folding. If I have the best hand right now, great. And if I don't, I'm getting the right odds to set mine anyways. The flop is a bit of a disaster. Ace-8-8 eight eight is not a flop that I want to see. I'm still losing to jacks, queens, kings. If he has something like ace-king or ace-queen, I'm now losing. And honestly, if he does have a 4-bet bluff, it's going to have an ace in it more often than not. While I'm racking my brain to try to come up with hands that I could actually beat, something like king-queen suited maybe, Chad decides to bet very small. I honestly really like this sizing by him. I think it puts hands exactly like mine in the bin. I'm not really happy with calling or folding against this. But, me being me, I do decide to call and take a turn. The turn is an offsuit jack, which is another terrible card, because if he was bluffing with, like, king jack or queen jack, he's now winning as well. At this point, if his hands go anywhere near his chip stack, I'm going to be folding. But, he does end up checking, and I very happily take my free card. The river is the extremely safe five of diamonds, and now, the wheels in my head start turning. Honestly, I think this is one of the worst hands I get to the river with, and I'm really considering bluffing if it's checked to me again. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, Chad doesn't give me that opportunity and fires out a huge bet himself. At this point, I think I have a very easy fold for all the reasons I mentioned before, and I pretty quickly lay it down. Chad ended up having ace-king, so we got unlucky on the flop, but managed to lose very little after our hand wasn't good anymore. The next hand starts with yours truly generously putting on that $50 straddle. And I look down at ace-8 suited under the gun. We're gonna raise this up, I make it $150 to go. Poker Traveler to my left flicks in the call, folds all the way around to Jesse in the straddle. And we look down at king-queen offsuit in the big blind and call as well. Shocker. So the three of us all see the king-queen-9 who diamond board. The flop is a good one. We've got top two. All right. Time to punish Ashley for that very callous raise preflop. I check it over to her. I don't know about you, but I do not see a spade. I don't see any sort of connection with my hand. And with these two positions calling, I think that one of them is likely to have smashed this board. So I check it over to Poker Traveler who throws out a bet. 
And since I've already mentally checked out of this hand and I've already folded in my head, I'm gonna let Jesse take over the hand from here. I don't know if it's a timing tell or just something in my subconscious, but it feels awfully strong. Normally I would always raise here, but given this feeling that I have, mixed with the fact that Ashley looked very disinterested in the hand, so I'm not worried about her calling behind and having a flush draw or something, I decided to just call and kind of slow play my hand, and maybe if I'm somehow beat, find a way to not lose my entire stack. It's also always nice to have some slow plays on a board this draw heavy. I think that if I just call the flop and Poker Traveler does have a bluff, he's not going to slow down on most turns or rivers. So I do call, Ashley folds, and the turn is a wild one, the 10 of diamonds. This is actually one of the few cards I do think he might slow down with on his bluffs. Being out of the big blind, I do make a lot of flushes on this board that he doesn't. Also, when I check call the flop, I can have a lot of possible straights, so I decide that this is a board that I do want to lead a lot. Now, king-queen is not the first hand you would think about leading on this type of turn, but I actually think it makes some sense. If he has a two-pair hand, he's going to slow down, so I will get a little bit of value out of him by leading. I put out 200. He calls extremely quickly, and the river is not exactly the card we're looking for. The river nine means that we're now losing to some of the two pairs that we were beating on the turn. It's also not a great card because he's the player who has the full houses in this spot and I really don't have many full houses now. I'm not thrilled about this river. One thing is for sure, I'm pretty happy checking. Now he bets really small. Okay. I don't think calling is an option. I really don't even know what bluffs he could get to the river with. It's so hard to come up with a potential bluff. So I'm either folding or I'm potentially turning my hand into a bluff and raising really large. The problem with bluffing here is that I just don't know what full houses I show up with on the river. He might think that I check raise for value with the ace high flush and maybe I do, but I think it's a tough sell to try to tell him that I have a bunch of strong hands on this river the way I've played. So. After running a bunch of very heroic scenarios in my head, I finally decided to just fold my cards. I do find out later that he had jack-10 of spades, which makes me quite happy with my flop play, I'm not gonna lie. A little later, jack-high limps from under the gun, and I'm in early position and look down at pocket jacks. I raise it up. It folds back around a jack-high, who is still stacking chips from the pot he just won, and he very quickly re-raises to 425. These sort of limp re-raises often set off alarm bells in my head, and I think they're quite likely indicative of a range that's super strong, something like aces and kings, and maybe that's it. All right, at this point, you guys are used to seeing Jesse up here in this little corner for Coach's Corner, but today we're gonna turn it into Student Square, which is basically just me asking him questions about his hands. So earlier we saw Jack High limp and call, he's limp and folded, now he's limp three betting you, so what do you make of his range here? Jack High has been looser than most, and he's been limping a lot, so I actually think he'll have some more hands here, but I still think he'll be quite strong. I'm thinking that he could have hands like pocket tens, ace king, ace queen, and then maybe he mixes in some bluffs as well. I'm not exactly sure what, but it could be some ace x suited, queen ten suited, it could be something like king queen offsuit. Honestly, I'm really not sure because I don't see this type of move that often. We go to the flop and it's honestly a pretty great one. 6-5 deuce rainbow is about as good as it's going to get for my hand without flopping a set. He bets somewhat small, 300 into 900. And now I do some thinking. I have a bit of a classic situation in the sense that my hand is pretty strong, but it's still vulnerable to the hands that I beat. The hands like ace king, ace queen, maybe king queen all have two over cards, and I wouldn't mind protecting from those or charging them to draw right now. I also feel like if I do raise the flop right now, I'm always gonna get to see the river for the price that I set because I have the option to just check back on the turn. So, I make it 950. He calls fairly quickly and pretty confidently, and we see a very safe turn card in the deuce of clubs. He checks the turn, it's not time to get fancy, let's just stick with the plan that we had on the flop, and maybe we have to make some difficult decisions on the river. The river is the queen of diamonds, which is pretty far from a blank. This actually improves a hand like ace-queen if he did play it this way. He immediately starts looking at his chips, then playing with his chips. Just a bunch of signs that he is going to bet this river, but he's not sure what size to bet. To be honest, I've seen that sort of activity from players who are bluffing or players who have it, but in this particular instance, it really felt like strength to me. He does finally bet, and it's quite small. 
Just over $1,000 into almost a $3,000 pot. Man, I feel so torn here. I'm getting a great price, and I don't need to win that often. But it also kind of feels like if I put the money in the pot, I'm just never going to win. Whatever. He's listening to the conversation on the table, like, smiling. But it was like He's not worried about a call. I mean, well, it's hard to say. It's, oh, wow. Nice World nice class. Fold. This is honestly so painful. The stream is winding down, so I'm desperate to get involved in at least some hands. When I look down, a king six of hearts on the button. The $100 straddle is on. I've only got 3,700 or so in my stack, which is a pretty short stack in a cash game. So I open it up to $300. Poker Guru is in the biggest straddle. He defends, and we both see the king nine five two club board. He checks it over to me. I do flop top pair, but it was one of the worst kings that I will be opening on the button. So I want to employ some pot control, especially against someone who's known to be super aggressive and I can easily call him down on the turn in river. So I check it back. The turn comes at the nine of spades. So things are getting a little interesting. And although these live stream graphics say that Rob only has like 2K, you can see plaques and huge stacks in front of him. One of those yellow plaques is worth $5,000. So he does not have just 2K in front of him. He is super deep. He leads now for $600 on the turn into a 685, a pretty large bet. But like I said, this was my plan all along. I'm willing to call down. So I stick in my 600 bucks. The river is the six of clubs. Not looking great for me, you guys. And when he goes over 150% of the pot size on this river, my hand turns into a very clear bluff catcher. And when you're bluff catching, you want to have at least one card in your hand that blocks your opponent's value betting hands. So I would like a seven, an eight, or a club in my hand. And since I don't have any of those things, I just resign myself to this not being a very good session for me and toss my hand into the buck. Unfortunately, Poker Guru had queen four offsuit for just absolute air balls. So I got to give him props for bluffing me off top pair. It was a really good spot for him, but he played it well and took advantage of the runout. The next hand starts with Ebony convincing me to put on the $100 double straddle. I'm about three glasses of wine in, so that's not going to be a particularly difficult sell here. Rhonda limps from early position. Jack high in the smallest blind raises it up to a pretty small sizing, 350. Ebony calls, and I look down at ace eight of spades. And at the time, I thought that re-raising was probably the best play. But for reasons beyond me, I decide to just call. I'm not saying that calling is terrible by any means, but I just think that re-raising is probably a little bit better. The sizing feels kind of weak. I don't think that Ebony's call signals any sort of strength as well. And it's a nice spot to take down a pretty large pot preflop. But I do make the call, and Rhonda calls behind, so we go four ways to the flop. The 8-5 deuce flop is a pretty great one for me. My opponents could have some sets, and Jack High can certainly have the over pairs, but my hand fares to be the best hand a decent chunk of the time. I'm feeling even better about it after Jack High and Ebony both check, because I expect them to fast play their hands most of the time. I put out a smallish bet of $400. Rhonda folds, Jack High folds, and then Ebony... Check raises to $1,500. This is devastating. I don't really expect her to have any pure bluffs, so I'm likely up against a range that is something like sets, maybe the occasional overpair, and then some flush draws that I'm not super far ahead of. I'm not going to lie, this is likely one of those spots where it's awfully close between all three different choices. I call with the plan of getting it in on most non-diamond turns. I think it's a good idea to wait till we see a blank turn and clear up equity a little bit against the flush draws before putting the rest of the money in. And honestly, if the turn is a diamond, I'm probably drawing dead a little too often for my liking. We put the money in and the seven of clubs rolls off on the turn. Ebony jams and I'm actually feeling pretty bad on this particular turn card. I mull this decision over for a little while because it feels ridiculous to fold top pair getting the price that I am. But there's just something in my gut that I don't know, it feels wrong here. Finally, I just decide that she's got too many hands that have me dead, and the rest of the hands that she has here probably have some sort of combo draw to them. I eventually make the fold. Ebony ends up having six for her diamonds, which makes our exact play look really, really good. So, on the plus side, I have lost close to the minimum in a bunch of hands in a row. On the other hand, this has been very costly. We have gone from being up 4,000 early on in the session to now stuck 1.3K. Feels bad, man. 
my last hand of the night, I opened the very next hand with King 10 offsuit into Poker Guru's now $50 straddle. I make it 150 to go and he makes the call. The flop comes down 10 6 6. He checks, I see bet 125 bucks, he calls. The turn is a jack. Once he checks, I slow down a little bit. Once again, I can call a lot of rivers. I don't wanna bloat this pot too much. The last hand of the night, people just seem to love bluffing me in this session, so I check it back. The river is a four of clubs. He leads for an interesting size. He goes once again over the pot. He goes $700 into a $580 pot. I think this is a pretty simple decision. I just flick in the call, didn't really think about it too much and he had a worse 10. So at least I get to win a little pot towards the end of the night. I ended up reloading at some point in this game. So I'm in for $9,000 out for 7,960 bucks. Losing $1,000 in this big of a game feels like breaking even, so I'll take it. All in all, I was in for 10K, out for 8.7. So after a very swingy session, down $1,300.